derrière quand il sera passé. Ah ouais, mais il va repasser. Il va être de l'autre côté. d'être présent pour cette conférence assez exceptionnelle de Team Ingol. Donc je vais dire simplement deux mots d'accueil de la conférence de Team Ingol. Et après Théa va nous dire deux mots aussi dans la fermeture, la closure du, de la conférence qui a eu lieu aujourd'hui, du colloque. Et puis Tim après va vous, vous donner sa conférence. Alors évidemment, à Grenoble et ici à l'école d'architecture, on est très très heureux d'accueillir Tim. Euh, et on a, on a vraiment, je crois, une très très grande chance de l'avoir avec nous. Je pense que vous en avez entendu parler sans doute déjà, vous l'avez sans doute lu aussi. Donc quelques mots simplement pour le présenter très rapidement. Euh, donc Tim Ingold est professeur émérite d'anthropologie à l'université d'Aberdeen. Il est, comme vous le savez, internationalement reconnu comme un des plus grands anthropologues euh, contemporains actuellement. Et sa pensée irrigue vraiment la recherche en sciences sociales, et ça déborde d'ailleurs la recherche en sciences sociales. Alors c'est une œuvre qui est absolument impressionnante par sa diversité, sa profusion, son originalité. Euh, Peut-être pour donner quelques références, quelques repères, tout simplement si vous ne connaissez pas encore son, son œuvre, il s'est fait connaître en fait par un ouvrage qui a été publié en 2000, qui s'appelle The Perception of the Environment, qui a été un, un ouvrage assez important et clé pour le faire connaître à l'échelle internationale. Et depuis, depuis une dizaine d'années, il a été traduit en français, beaucoup, et de plus en plus. Je vais vous donner simplement quelques titres des ouvrages qui ont été traduits en français, et d'autres arrivent, et bon, c'est une œuvre très, 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 très euh, prolixe. Donc, le, quelques titres de ces ouvrages traduits en français que vous pouvez trouver euh, très, très facilement. Une brève histoire des lignes, en 2011, qui a été euh, très euh, médiatisée aussi, qui, est, euh, qui a fait référence. « Marcher avec les dragons » en 2013, un ouvrage qui va certainement vous intéresser encore plus directement, qui s'appelle « Faire anthropologie, archéologie, art et architecture », publié en 2017. Et puis en, ensuite, euh, « L'anthropologue, euh, l'anthropologie comme éducation » en 2018. Et puis, euh, un de ces derniers qui, euh, qui a été traduit euh, il n'y a pas longtemps, Machia, « euh, Machiavel chez les babouins » pour une anthropologie au-delà de l'humain, publiée en 2021. Euh, Peut-être que si vous ne connaissez pas encore l'œuvre de Tim Ingold, une façon très rapide et économique et extrêmement stimulante d'y rentrer, c'est aussi une conférence qui s'est tenue il y a quelques années à l'UGA, ah, je ne sais pas si vous avez eu l'occasion d'y assister, qui est un, en fait un dialogue avec euh, un autre grand anthropologue français qui s'appelle euh, Philippe Descola, et donc ce, ce dialogue-là a été publié dans un petit ouvrage qui s'appelle « Être au monde, quelle expérience commune ?» Donc c'est un tout petit ouvrage qui met en scène la, le dialogue entre Tim Ingold et Philippe Descola. Vous allez l'entendre, de toute façon, Tim a un questionnement fondamental sur l'interface entre les sciences sociales, l'anthropologie et l'art, l'architecture, et ça va être aussi l'objet de sa, son intervention. Vous allez entendre, peut-être à demi-mot, et vous allez le trouver dans ces ouvrages, tout un ensemble de notions, d'idées, qui traite des notions de flux, de lignes, de tissage, une attention portée à la cré créativité en acte, à la question du vivant et à l'écologie de la vie. Alors, trois bonnes raisons au moins d'accueillir Tim Ingold ici. Premièrement, pour la clôture de cette conférence-là, et Théa va nous en dire deux, deux mots juste après. Donc, on est évidemment très heureux d'accueillir Tim pour clore cette conférence sur l'architecture. Vous allez voir que la conférence de Tim traite précisément de cette question-là. Deuxième bonne raison, si ça vous intéresse, vous savez que Tim Ingold va recevoir le titre de docteur honoris causa de l'UGA, qui sera décerné demain sur le campus à l'Amphiveille. Donc il y a une cérémonie est prévue, qui est ouverte à tous, qui est complètement publique, où il y aura la remise du titre de, doc, euh, de docteur honoris causa, Tim, et, et à d'autres, euh, d'ailleurs, euh, personnes. Donc euh, 
ça vous intéresse, à une heure et demie, deux heures, à l'amphi veille sur le campus. Et il y aura donc aussi une intervention de Tim qui présente aussi euh, ses travaux sur l'anthropologie. Troisième raison aussi, c'est euh, un atelier qu'on a tenu ce matin euh, avec Tim Gold sur une recherche en cours au sein de, de l'école d'architecture en lien avec Pacte et l'UGA qui s'intitule Sensibilia, qui a trait aux questions de sensibilité euh, écologique. Donc beaucoup de raisons effectivement d'accueillir euh, Tim euh, euh, avec nous. Autre euh, et dernière chose, et je m'arrêterai là, Tim est également un, un, un grand professeur, il a un vrai intérêt pour euh, l'enseignement, la pédagogie, l'éducation, la question de l'attention, et vous allez l'entendre dans sa conférence comment cette euh, dimension-là est extrêmement importante et, euh, et, et pose de vraies questions fondamentales sur euh, l'architecture. Donc je ne vais pas dévoiler ou, outre mesure euh, son intervention, euh, son, en, sa conférence s'intitule euh, « Architecture Educates ». Euh, je ne vais pas dévoiler son propos, donc c'est une, une proposition assez stimulante, très intéressante sur la question de l'architecture, qui est très engagée aussi et qui est porteuse d'espoir d'une certaine manière. Pour ceux et celles qui n'étaient pas dans la salle dans la journée ou avec nous dans la journée, restituer un peu en quoi cette conférence-là clôt un colloque qui s'est tenu aujourd'hui dans les murs de cette école et qui portait sur les pédagogies qu'on a choisi d'appeler « hors les murs », les « outdoor pedagogies ». I will speak in English later, it will come. Donc, encore, toute la journée, on a parlé de pédagogie, des pédagogies euh, euh, qui se veulent engagées, qui se veulent euh, un peu particulières, qui se veulent collaboratives, coopératives, hors des murs des établissements, avec des acteurs autres, euh, sur le terrain, avec le terrain. Euh, donc la conférence de Tim Gold vient euh, de manière assez naturelle, j'ai envie de dire, clore cette journée-là très riche. Je réitère l'invitation de Jean-Paul de lire ses écrits, à la fois sur euh, sa production, on va dire, théorique, mais aussi sur les écrits qu'il a, qu a euh, publiés sur les questions de la pédagogie et de l'enseignement. Euh, il y en a un qui n'a pas été cité, que moi j'aime ai, beaucoup dans le titre, mais Chab, qui est aux, aux éditions des Dalles, et c'est le labyrinthe où... Nicolas. Le Dédale et le Labyrinthe, qui est un tout petit ouvrage euh, qui parle euh, de pédagogie, qui moi m'a beaucoup touché euh, quand je l'ai lu. Euh, donc voilà, je, je m'arrête là en français et euh, j'ai fait le choix de m'adresser aussi à, à Tim Ingold directement, donc je vais faire en anglais. Je m'excuse pour mon accent, euh, mais je trouvais que c'était important aussi de le remercier euh, pour plein de raisons que vous soyez que je reviendrai. So Tim, I'll speak just for three minutes in English. I'm sorry for my accent and my possible, certain, for, uh, error, false, I don't know, <laughs> mistake, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I would like to congratulate you for the honoris causa that you are going to receive tomorrow. Uh, I would like also to say that your work res resonates with the work of the Cresson et AAU, but more generally with the work that is done here in pedagogical and research uh, questions in the School of Architecture of Grenoble. So it's uh, a real, I don't know how to say that, natural, Uh, thing to have you here with us today um, and I wanted to thank you uh, sincerely because you have uh, made the choice to adapt your conference for uh, today to the subject that we treated the whole day and it's uh, really nice of you to have done this effort for us um, and uh, thank you just to be here with us so once again um, we are excited to hear you and uh, I'll let you Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup et bonsoir à tous. It's a great honor for me too to be here with you and I'm very happy to be among you here. It is impossible these days to read any report whether it be in a sector of science technology, business management, defense, or public policy, without being struck by the frequent occurrence of apparently nonsensical strings of capital letters. Sometimes they are unpronounceable as well, so that the only way to read them out is by voicing their constituent letters. The string WMD for example, would be read as WMD. Others, however, appear to form pronounceable words, which might even have homony homonymic counterparts in ordinary language. 
So the name of the laboratory pact here in Grenoble Alps would be uh, pronounced pact. And in this talk I'll be especially concerned with two similar constructions, each of which has a counterpart in ordinary language, namely S-T-E-M and S-T-E-A-M. S-T-E-M, a stem, is an ascending axis of vegetative growth. S-T-E-M, steam, is hot vapour. Like pact, P-A-C-T-E, however, stem and steam are compressions in which each capital letter stands for a longer word that begins with it. With pact, here in Grenoble Alps, P stands for public policy, A and C for action, T and E for territories. In STEM, S is for science, T is for technology, E for engineering, and M for mathematics. The extra A inserted into the middle of STEAM, S-T-E-A-M, is for art, but it could just as well stand for architecture. Now, such compressions are known as acronyms. So when we encounter the acronym PACT, we should know that it stands for public policy, political action and territories. When we come across STEM, we know that it stands for science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Changing STEM to STEAM adds art or architecture into the mix. And these acronyms are all of rather recent origin. STEM was rare before the turn of this century, but in the ensuing two decades it has become ubiquitous. STEAM appears to have been coined a few years later, around 2010, but is rapidly gaining ground. Both acronyms are most at home in the areas of intersection between where educational policy meets research and innovation. And the same goes for your own pact, which, as I understand it, dates from 2003. It is, as I read on the website, affiliated to CNRS, based in UGA, and associated with FSNP, and so one can go on and on. I want to show that there is more to the fashion for acronyms than an innocent matter of expository convenience, of saving us the trouble of having to repeat complex verbal sequences. It is rather a sign of the deep-seated instrumentalization of language and the corresponding banishment of affect that has accompanied the rise and inexorable expansion around the globe of an order of relations in which every conceivable thing carries value as a marketable commodity. This, of course, is the order of neoliberalism. And in the context of educational provision, the commodity most in demand is knowledge. And un under the acronym of STEM, S-T-E-M, education in the many disciplines of science, technology, engineering and mathematics has been harnessed to the relentless demand of the neoliberal economy for knowledge products. And in this, students are cast as consumers, while educators are service providers tasked with delivering the products their students wish to acquire. So what, then, can art and architecture do? In the following, I will set out three possible answers to this question. In the first scenario, the incorporation of arts and architecture-based pedagogy into the STEM agenda, under the acronym STEAM, merely underlines underlines its market-led objectives. The second answer posits a complementarity 
between STEM and art and architecture, while according to each its own distinctive raison d'etre. The third, however, destabilises the entire project of STEM, exposes its underlying assumptions, restores ways of knowing the world to ways of being in it, and rescues science, technology, engineering and mathematics from their STEM-induced stultification. Only by following this third way, I contend, can art and architecture become ways of educating in themselves. So to begin, let me return to acronymics. What is it about the acronym that makes it so attractive to scientists, technocrats and policy makers? The answer, I believe, is that it allows them to identify the matters of their concern without having to speak or spell out their names. When we give voice to words, or even when we write them down, we join, we join our own lives, just for a moment, with the things of which they tell. We and they go along together. It's a kind, in a kind of correspondence. But if words are the ways we have of joining with the world, acronym, acronyms serve the opposite end of cutting us off. With the acronym, we can refer to things without having to dwell on them, attend to them, or correspond with them. We have no need to mix our lives with theirs. Instead, we can turn our backs on things, or put them out of mind, feigning indifference or objectivity. The enunciation of the acronym leaves no trace of affect. Short-circuiting names, the acronym also short-circuits any feeling we might have from the things they evoke. It arouses no passions, no recollections, no spectres from the past. It betokens nothing but sterile, detached instrumentality. And that's why the acronym is such an effective instrument of oversight in both its senses of inadvertence and control. It allows affairs to be regulated and managed in ways unsullied by personal involvement or responsibility. And it allows the research scientist or the technocrat to hide behind a veneer of methodological rigour and professional expertise. Now this argument applies, among other things, to the names we give to fields of study. And these names matter. Spelled out in full, they carry the weight of tradition and are bound up with the lives and identities of practitioners. If, for example, I were to declare that I am a philosopher, I would be saying something about myself and about how my own ways of thinking and feeling have she been shaped by the scholars with whom and the works with which I have studied. I would profess quite literally to a love of wisdom and learning. And it's no different in practice for scientists, technologists, engineers and mathematicians, and indeed artists. Say the word science, not casually, but with deliberation. Pause on it for a while, and you are transported into a landscape of inquiry stretching as far as the eye can see, ripe for exploration. Say the word technology, again with the same care, and an entire vista of human undertaking opens up before you from the handicrafts of our ancestors to, today, to today's information systems. Say engineering, and you're with Archimedes and Leonardo and with the great inventors who brought us steam power and aviation, all intent on harnessing the protean forces of nature and putting them to human use. 
say, mathematics, and you enter an, enchant an, an enchanted world of pure form, with an incomparable beauty and a certain mystique of its own. As for art and architecture, the associations of these words are limitless, encompassing the entire gamut of human ways of making and building from antiquity to the present. Now, over the past several centuries, these great historical endeavours have been conjoined in an ambitious programme of human improvement launched under the banner of the Enlightenment. It is a programme that has brought priceless benefits. Thanks to science and its applications, millions of people can enjoy longer and more comfortable lives than their ancestors could ever have imagined. Humanism, placed in the service of the common good, has brought schooling, literacy and democratic governance to more than ever before. STEM and STEAM, however, emerged not as the climax of the humanist programme, but as pathologies, byproducts of the neoliberal subversion of its progressive impulse to the logic and interests of global capital. While there are histories of science, of technology, of engineering and mathematics, as well as histories of art and of architecture, there is no history of STEM or of STEAM. In the name of interdisciplinarity, these acronymic constructions cut across the histories of knowledge, much as internationalism cuts across the histories of nations. And having no past, neither STEM nor STEAM opens to a future. Or more precisely, its future can only be a target, an end point at which existing models are finally converted into reality or projections into fact. And this is a future incubated in cavernous glass-walled enclosures, ranging from research laboratories to corporate headquarters, or even giant domes devoted to the simulation of natural ecosystems. Their closely guarded and strictly controlled interiors masquerading as <coughs> open access, disguising secrecy as transparency. So the acronym is like a key code that unlock, unlocks the door to the incubator and only those in possession of the code can enter. Now the idea of adding A for art or architecture to STEM, turning it, turning it into STEAM, began in the Rhode Island School of Design, known by its own acronym RISD. Founded in 1877, the school was one of the first independent colleges of art and design in the United States and regularly features today as one of the top design schools in the world. And this is how the RISD describes the initiative. I quote, RISD has long valued the symbiosis between the arts and sciences weaving cross-disciplinary exploration into various studio practices. In 2010, the college began to champion the addition of art and design to the national agenda of STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, math, education and research, to develop a comprehensive educational model that would better prepare generations to compete in the 21st century innovation economy. So the crux lies in that last line, to compete in the 21st century innovation economy, which unambiguously places the goals of education within the economic regime of neoliberalism. Art and design are to be subordinated to the same instrumental objectives that have already taken hold 
in science, technology, engineering and mathematics. The idea is to bring art, architecture and design into the frame as ways of thinking outside the box, which the STEM project requires in order to satisfy its insatiable thirst for innovation. In the marketplace of knowledge, novelty is a condition for competitive advantage and artists, architects and designers, known as creatives, are tasked with coming up with the new ideas the competition calls for, not just for designing new knowledge products, but for their ad advertisement. Art and design could make them attractive to consumers, especially the young, to whom the sense of wonder is marketed as a prize commodity. In this way of thinking, creativity and innovation mean much the same thing, and they come together in the idea of what it means to be smart, an idea that has gained extraordinary traction in recent years. Smart refers to an intelligence that is quick and nimble in solving problems, as well as devious, giving its possessor a competitive edge over his or her more slow-witted rivals. It is the hallmark of the successful entrepreneur and often placed at the top in any list of attributes that a STEM-based education should inculcate in students exposed to it. And yet, an education in art, architecture and design surely teaches us more than how to be smart. Even those who have succeeded in the cutthroat world of corporate competition would admit that their rise would be without meaning if the view from the top revealed nothing of intrinsic value. Is not the role of art to widen our horizons, perhaps even to open our hearts and minds to more fundamental truths? Might it even restore our faith in the project of enlightenment? A variety of arguments have been proposed along these lines. At their most trivial, they reduce art to its value as entertainment designed to fill the empty hours of affluent leisure. And for some, art answers to a yearning for sublimity or mystery or wonder in a world otherwise so analysed as to have lost its power to enchant. And for others, it is a sign of cultural creativity, an acknowledgement of diversity or a badge of civilization. There is a widespread recognition these days of the need to complement the detached objectivity, cold logic and analytic rigour of science with something more subjective, more attuned to feeling, empathy and holistic understanding. And this bifurcation is of course deeply sedimented in the modern constitution. It's even alleged to be wired into the human brain in the division between its left and right sides. An education in art, then, is supposed to help with the development of the right side of the brain, tempering the dominance of the left and offering students a more rounded <coughs> formation that enhances their ability to relate to their surroundings. However, this logic of complementarity, while it confers an, on art and architecture an intrinsic merit equal to that of science, does nothing to challenge STEM on its own ground. On the contrary, it reproduces a persistent dualism between affective embodied experience and the cognitive operations of a disembodied intellect or between aesthetic judgment and the work of reason, each furnished with its own distinctive powers of creativity. Many advocates of a move from STEM to STEAM see the insertion of the arts as a necessary rebalancing, designed to moderate 
the profiteering of the neoliberal project by giving it a human face and a moral conscience. Indeed, a move along these lines has recently pro pro been proposed by no less august a body to which I belong than the British Academy, though with a remit not limited to the arts but also including the humanities and social sciences as well. Seeking to emulate the success of STEM in attracting funding and in securing links to government and business, the British Academy proposes a matching acronym, SHAPE, S-H-A-P-E, standing for Social Sciences, Humanities and the Arts for People and the Economy. According to the Academy website, SHAPE promises to collaborate with STEM so as to, and I quote, make innovation work harder for the benefit of everyone and, I quote again, to bring colour, texture, opinion and perspective to our everyday. Now this gloss scarcely rocks the boat, however. Indeed, it, in its offer to leaven the austerity of STEM with empathy, self-expression and local colour, the SHAPE initiative submits <coughs> to the very forces that have already harnessed the constituent disciplines of STEM in the corporate capture of research and education. Now, I contend that art, architecture and design have a far more radical role to play. And it is to change the very meaning and purpose of education across every field of study, from the efficient delivery of knowledge products to student consumers, to an endless journey of discovery on which students and teachers are embarked together, driven not by a market-led demand for innovation, but by a passion to seek the truth of what is real and present in the world. So far from opening up a space for the cultivation of subjective self-expression, alongside and as a complement to the space of objective knowledge transfer, this is to bring students into an ongoing dialogue with the world itself, affording them the possibility to attend to the things and beings to be found there, to answer to their presence, and to explore the conditions of their coexistence with them. So instead of educating students on the subjects of art, here including architecture and design, it is the practices of art that educate. And they do so by opening a path, or showing the way, guiding attention towards aspects of the world which might be worthy of closer study. This is to recover the very sense of correspondence, that is, of going along with things and learning from them, that is repudiated by the logic of the acronym. The acronym, as we've seen, cuts us off from the matters of which we speak, promoting an attitude that is at once disengaged and manipulative, <coughs> epitomised in the word smart. The practices of art, however, foster precisely the opposite attitude of enduring attention, responsiveness and care. Now, arguably, this attitude has always been the hallmark of true scholarship, even in fields that would nowadays come under the umbrella of science. It's there in the biologist's attention to living things, in the chemist's attention to the properties of materials, in the physicist's attention to matter itself. Technology and engineering likewise resemble craft in the perceptual acuity and respect for materials required of their practitioners. As for mathematics, the rootedness of mathematical understanding in gesture, rhythm and trace, and its proximity to the arts of music and dance, have been evident since ancient <coughs> times, notwithstanding the myths of intellectual genius that have grown up around it. 
And for such giants of the past as Vitruvius, Alberti, Leonardo and Constable, founding figures respectively in architecture, perspective, anatomy and meteorology, science and art were never separate or even separable endeavours, but rather long-standing traditions of inquiry, unified by their commitment to careful observation, patient experimentation, precise description, and informed speculation. Indeed, this is how the real sciences and real scientists have always worked and still work today, feeling their way from within, guided by genuine wonder, curiosity and care. But this calls for an imagination wholly distinct from the kind of imagination coveted by STEM or even by STEAM. It's an imagination that, far from closing in on smart solutions, opens up to the world's ceaseless formation, drawing its creative powers from that self-same source. So could the role of art, architecture and design be to resituate this kind of imagination at the very heart of education? Well, education is the means by which any society ensures its future. The question of the role of the arts in education then admits of different answers depending on the kinds of futures they entail. We've seen that the logic of STEM is uncompromising in its repudiation of the past. And without a past, STEM cannot grow into the future. Its claim, rather, is to be the future. The future for STEM is virtually upon us, the reality of the present already out of date. This is why its metaphors of choice are state of the art and the cutting edge. Some things, of course, come with a lead time attached of years or perhaps de decades, and yet they are ready to be rolled out, the machinery to realise them up and running. And if the future is waiting, then youngsters must be readied for it. And this, according to its rhetoric, is what STEM education is about. That is, preparing the coming generation for a cutthroat world in which only the smart will survive. Nothing seems more important than employability, booking a place in the new technocratic world order. And it's an order that promises untold wealth and aimless luxury for the few that make it into its glass palaces, while dismissing the remaining inhabitants of a ravaged and depleted planet as surplus to requirements. Anyone deemed unemployable is destined for the scrap heap, and with every passing year the competition intensifies. As the future comes ever closer, time itself is compressed into the plane of instantaneity. It is the time of now. So the shift from STEM to STEAM in its original formulation would supercharge this already hyperbolic futurism. As the Rhode Island School of Design declares in its propaganda, the future for which STEAM prepares its students is the 21st century innovation economy. Like athletes practicing for the Olympics, they are to be trained to compete and success is measured by financial reward. Those, however, who propose adding the arts to STEM on the grounds of complementarity take a broader view, more wedded to the humanistic ideals of progressive enlightenment. Money, they say, isn't everything. In their rhetoric, art and architecture provide the means for students to fulfil their potential as well-rounded citizens by furnishing the means of self-expression otherwise excluded by the rigour and severity of STEM. 
In their view, education is above all a vehicle of progress, a means to ensure that every generation betters its predecessors. The future lies in human self-improvement. And yet the discourse of fulfilment describes life as a movement towards closure, a gradual filling up of capacities and shutting down of possibilities. The human being who at birth brims with as yet unformed potential ends with that potential exhausted, with nothing further to do than to reflect on past achievements. And the result is a picture of life shaped rather like a bell curve, like that, roughly divisible into three phases, an initial phase of growth and formation, in which the young are readied to enter the world that awaits them, a final phase of reversal and decline as capacities fade, that's where I'm supposed to be now, and in between, a phase in which human world-forming powers are at their, speak, at their peak. So children, middle people, and then the old. And in modern societies, it is this intermediate generation, thrust between youth and old age, that holds all the cards. Indeed, so busy are its people with their world-making, so preoccupied with the affairs of the day, that they pay scant regard to their elders or to their juniors. Old people, they think, having already enjoyed their place in the sun, should sink gracefully into obscurity. Their time is past, their days over. Young people, to the contrary, need to be brought up to speed, to face a future prepared for them. And yet, this model of generational succession, so fundamental to the Enlightenment idea of progress, contains an inherent contradiction. Because if the present intermediate generation has already made a world for the generation to come, what is there left for this coming generation to do? How can it take up the mantle of world-making except by either undoing or overwriting the work of its predecessor. So with every passing generation, it seems, its predecessor's designs for the future must be obliterated, while its successor, in its turn, is equally bound to bury the future that had been made for it. Why else are the iconic machines of our age the bulldozer and the crane. The bulldozer clears the ground of past interventions, leading none to pick up and follow. The crane lifts new designs into place from above. Indeed, if every future is a present prediction, then not only do all predictions fail, they must fail for every generation to have a future it can call its own. There's a striking parallel here with the idea of progress in science, which is likewise supposed to proceed through conjecture and refutation. So in science, as in society, <coughs> progress is founded upon a history of predictive failure. Yet this kind of serial replacement of futures conjectured only to be refuted hardly amounts to a formula for sustainable living. Sustaining life means keeping it going, perpetually opening to new beginnings, rather than restarting over and over again on the back of past closures. And as we have found to our cost these days, sustainability is incompatible with the doctrine of progressive change. We can't have it both ways. And for advocates of the shift from STEM to STEAM on grounds of complementarity, 
Education in the arts is a means to the ends of progress. I want to suggest to the contrary that only an education turned around by art that corresponds with the world rather than seeking to manipulate it to human advantage, only such art can, only such an education can further the cause of sustainable living. And this means thinking differently about intergenerational relations. Modern thought tends to imagine every generation in its active phase as occupying the plane of the present. As it reaches its prime, it layers its own designs and constructions over those of generations past. And each layer establishes its own plane of synchrony, while layer follows layer in a diachronic sequence, burying those beneath, much as in an archive, old documents are buried under more recent ones. Renewal can only come from superposition, from adding one layer after another to the stack. But what if instead we were to align successive generations longitudinally, allowing them to overlap and entwine along their lengths? No one lives forever, but so long as new lives are introduced as old lives passed, life itself can continue without end. And this is to liken the passage of generations to a rope rather than a stack. In the rope, each fibre is only so long, but by paying in new fibres as fast as old ones give out, the rope itself winds on indefinitely. Moreover, just as the twist of its overlapping fibres gives the rope its tensile strength, so also in life, it's by carrying on their lives together that the old and the young can lay an assured path for generations to come. And throughout most of history, indeed, this is precisely how human lives have been lived. Youngsters have grown up hearing the stories and observing the practices of their elders, discovering the meanings of the stories, and developing skills of practice in the passage of their own experience and becoming storytellers and practitioners in their turn. <coughs> Yet, by and large, this is no longer true today. But what happened? When and why did every intermediate generation come to see itself as the generation of now? What fired it with such world-making zeal as to consign the wisdom of its elders to history while treating its own children as creatures of nature at ground zero of civility in need of induction into a future they can have no hand in shaping? Well, answers are not easy to come by. They likely have much to do with capitalism's erosion of domestic modes of production and with the redeployment of educational functions from the family to the state. But whatever the reasons, it's clear today that generation now has little time for stories or for skills. These, it says, are the stuff of tradition preserved only to entertain the young in enactments of heritage or indulge the old in flights of nostalgia. So this intermediate generation, this generation of now, is target-driven. It has its ends and its means. Yet, as its ends expand, fuelled by ambitions of growth and development, so its means contract its short-term objectives hold no promise that life can endure beyond the future already in its sights. Faced with a looming environmental catastrophe, it has no answer save to dream of a permanent geotechnological fix or of finding new resource reservoirs on other planets, leaving the bulk of humanity to eke out a living 
on an irreparably damaged earth. Every competition has far more losers than winners, and for every individual smart enough to succeed, another million will fail. But a sustainable world cannot be for some, but not others, let alone reserved for a select few. It must have room for everyone and everything, not just now, but indefinitely. And I contend that there is but one way to bring about such a world, and that is to loosen the grip of the intermediate generation. So can we imagine a society in which young and old, currently excluded from the tasks of world-making, are once again enabled to work alongside one another in forging the conditions of collective life? Can we break the barriers of their institutionalised segregation, allowing them to reassemble in the everyday settings in which these tasks are typically carried out? And this question, I think, has, has massive implications for the way we think about education, about the wisdom of the elderly and the curiosity of the young, and about the potential of their collaboration. For both young children and the elderly are in touch in ways that target-driven intermediates are not with more enduring rhythms of time. This is a time not of succession and replacement, but of pure becoming or imminence. It's the time of weather and the seasons, of breaking waves and running rivers, of the growth and decay of vegetation and the coming and going of animals, of breaths and heartbeats. We sometimes say of children and of old people, even as we sometimes say of animals, that they live in the present without recollection or foresight. foresight forethought. Yet therein, in every present moment, lies an eternity. It's perhaps because their minds are no longer or not yet cluttered with recollections and predictions that the old and the very young are better able to attend to the world in its immediacy and more ready to be addressed by it. And this readiness opens a way for imagination. Because for old and young alike, imagination is not a power of conjecture, allowing for the projection in terms of the present of a future state of affairs. Nor, conversely, is memory the recollection of a past already buried. Rather, both imagination and memory coalesce in a beyond that is neither before nor after, but falls in an entirely different register. We could call it the register of longing. To long for things is neither to conjure up the future or to wish back the past. It is rather to align care and attention with the temporal stretch of life. And in this care and attentiveness lies both the curiosity of the young and the wisdom of the elderly. But neither juvenile curiosity nor seasoned wisdom hold much esteem in a societal regime that values objective knowledge and the operations of abstract reason above all else. For knowledge, putting answers ahead of questions, stamps out curiosity, while reason, privileging cognition over attention, leaves wisdom diminished by comparison. Indeed, within the prevailing value system that underlies our institutions of education and social care, dedicated respectively to preparing children for a predetermined future and sequestering the elderly for whom this future came too late, <coughs> the innocence of curiosity is assessed as a deficiency of knowledge 
and the humility of wisdom as the deficiency of mind. The former branded as ignorance, the latter as dementia. And for the generation of now, in command of the present, the idea that the demented and the ignorant might together forge the future would be manifestly absurd. To unite wisdom and curiosity, however, appears not only prudent but necessary for the renewal of life for generations to come. And this is not nostalgia or hankering for a lost past, nor is it a utopian fantasy for the future. It is rather, I think, a foundation for hope. But to turn hope into reality, old and young must once again come together, making their productive and mutually transformative collaboration into a force of renewal for the common good. So could perhaps this collaboration, rather than the unilateral transfer of knowledge from senior to junior generations be what education is really about. And that, I argue, is what it means for education to be turned around by art. It is above all in the combination of curiosity and wisdom that the artistic imagination comes into its own. To imagine thus is to answer to the stirring of a restless world, feeling one's way in the twilight with no clear end in sight, lured by what the philosopher John Dewey in his essay on art as experience described as an aura, dimly and imprecisely figured. And yet, as Dewey acknowledged, this kind of imagining is by no means limited to art or even to architecture or design. It is common, he said, to thinkers of all professions, be they poets or painters, scientists or philosophers, or we could add, technologists, engineers or mathematicians. All are driven by a compelling sense of longing, even though none can say exactly what they long for. Indeed, once the ends are known, once they come within reach of conceptual representation, all imagination ceases, and all remembering too. For longing can never be requited. Its potential must ever remain unfulfilled. There is no final release into the light. But for just this reason, longing is the guarantor that life can continue, that the aura of the future, receding in step with our advance, will never cease to beckon from beyond the horizons of conceptualization. So we thus arrive, in conclusion, at the very antithesis, the very opposite of STEAM, S-T-E-A-M. Instead of including education in art, architecture and design within a truncated compaction of science, technology, engineering and mathematics that cuts across their respective traditions of endeavour. We have gathered these traditions within an encompassing conception of education, education as the very work of art. Thank you very much. I need the mic to. Uh, on aurait besoin de faire fonctionner le micro pour pouvoir le faire tourner. Well, thank you very much, Tim, for your very, very wonderful conference. So, uh, so what we said with Tim is that, of, uh, bien sûr, on va ouvrir donc le, la discussion uh, à partir de son intervention, de ce que vous connaissez de Tim, de sa pensée, de tout ce qu'il nous a apporté uh, ce soir. 
Alors, on peut réagir en français ou en anglais. Sentez-vous à l'aise pour le faire dans l'une ou l'autre langue, et puis on trouvera les moyens de traduire si nécessaire euh, les choses, sachant que Tim comprend aussi le, le français quand il est parlé, euh, voilà, euh, doucement, enfin voilà. Mais on peut aussi traduire si vous, euh, si vous préférez parler en français ou bien euh, intervenir en anglais. Donc on va tout de suite ouvrir euh, la discussion, des remarques, des questions. Euh, euh... Sentez-vous libre en fait d'intervenir So Tim, I was, I was uh, yeah, so, yeah. I was just telling that we can either ask questions in French or English, and then we can translate yeah. or manage to yeah. understand each other. Yeah. Uh. Thank you very much. Um, it's a slightly difficult one coming from uh, ignorance more than uh, a very specific angle, but. You've equated art and architecture. Maybe you could say something about how these two relate or how they mm. differ, mm. Uh, so as to make it more clear as to how what you say about art actually concerns architecture as well. Yeah, th thank you very much. I have a feeling it's a question you're probably better able to answer than I can, uh, that you're in a better position to do it. It, 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 it seems that in, in many contexts, um, Art, architecture and design fall under the same umbrella and in many educational institutions they do. So there's this, you find a school of art and design and then find that the school of architecture is part of that or their neighbours or... It varies from one place to another but they're, they're often, they're, they, they are always very closely linked um, institutionally although related in different kinds of ways. So, so clearly, so far as educational institutions are concerned, I mean universities, colleges, there is a perception amongst those who manage those institutions that these three fields, art, architecture and design, are somehow joined at, at the hip. Um, and, and I think that that's the case and the real precedent for that, in my understanding, is the Bauhaus. Uh, the Bauhaus, in a way, epitomizes what I was trying to argue, namely uh, a, whole, uh, a whole program of education uh, that uh, although brought together precisely those three disciplines, art, architecture and design, was seen as fundamentally a way of, uh, of, of, of educating for a new future, for a new generation. So I'm thinking that, that, that sort of the prototypical linkage between the three, um, and it seems to me that in many areas we're coming back to that kind of con convergence. Though having said that, of course, there are divergences in the sense that uh, an architectural training would normally include uh, um, uh, important elements in engineering and technology which if you were getting trained in an art school you probably wouldn't get. So the, the, there are, it overlaps with, with STEM in a slightly different way. But clearly when the Rhode Island School of Design introduced A into change from STEM to STEAM, they were thinking of art, architecture and design as one package. Uh, uh, thank you for the, this great lecture. I have a, a kind of a half question, half joke. Uh, sorry before saying it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you mentioned yourself, your, one of your course was a 4A. Mm. As, so you use yourself the acronyms. Can you say a few words about it after being so critical about it? So good. Could I, could I say, if I caught the question, could I say a few words about the four A's? And it's a, because it's an acronym. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is it, yeah, so, yeah that's, why yeah, okay. I, that's what I meant. Um, As it, it, what, what does it inspire us to see four A's next to each other? Maybe, yeah. Or what, what are the vision behind the letters? I, I, I think actually the four A's started as a sort of joke. Um, and, and part of the joke was whether I could, when I proposed this course in about 2005 or something like that, or 2003, 
three, perhaps it was. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you propose a new course in the university, you have to fill up all kinds of bureaucratic forms telling you about what you're going to do and what the learning outcomes are going to be and so on. And, uh, and, and, and I wanted to see whether the university would be prepared to accept a course with a title called The Four A's. Um, I think, it, well it did, much to my surprise, but I wanted to see if it would work. But, um, but then when I, turned the, uh, uh, when I turned the course into a book, uh, which was called Making, eventually, and I was going to call it The Four A's because that was just how it was in my head, and the publisher rightly told me that if I published a book called The Four A's, nobody would have any idea what it was about. So, it, uh, so then it became uh, anthropology, archaeology, art and architecture appear fully spelled out in, in, in the subtitle of the book and that was perfectly good, uh, perfectly good advice. But, but just to add to your question, because this is more interesting, um, when I first conceived of this course I thought of it as being somehow cross-disciplinary. But uh, as it developed, and as I worked on it, and students worked on it, and I compiled the sort of literature they should look at, I found that it wasn't really like that at all. We weren't crossing over from one subject to another. We were actually developing a new subject, which didn't have a name. It, we didn't, never felt like about, it never felt like cutting across. It always felt like developing something from this conversation amongst authors who happen to be coming from different fields in their writings. Hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe can, if I can uh, ask you a question too. It seems to me that in your talk and also in your writing on education and somewhere else, the notion of correspondence is very important for you, going along, along with things. And uh, mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about this idea of correspondence, which is kind of yes. very interesting? Yeah, I, I, it has become very central. It started off just as a little thing, and then it grew and grew and grew. And, and I, I just wanted to find the right way of talking about how social life, social processes, um, and in the educational context, for example, uh, a teacher and a student going along together, about how they could be responding to one another as they go by facing in the same direction. So imagine a, an interaction between a, between a supervisor and a student, or a teacher and a student, and, and, and we tend to imagine, for example, in a school setting, that, um, that I'm the teacher and you're the pupil, and we are confronting each other face to face. Whereas the thing about correspondence is that, no, I'd actually be, be turning my back and I'd be on my way and you'd be either coming along behind me or we would be walking side by side, seeing, seeing the same things ahead, rather than looking... Like, I can see what's behind your back and you can see what's behind mine, and that's a very... It's rather antagonistic, rather aggressive. But with, with correspondence, you're moving along in the same direction. And that's what I wanted to get at instead of, of interaction. And the sense, then, that in moving along towards the future, it's not that I'm telling you what the future is and you've got to get ready for it, but that we're both moving along um, together. And that, that, that's why it turned out to be so important. And I like the, the term because it includes co, co, com, it means with, and respondere, to respond, answering with as you go along. That's why I like it. Mm. In a sense, I think this is maybe one of the most um, personal talks that I've heard you give. And I was wondering, you're someone that is very productive. You write many articles, many books. In terms of all the metrics of academia, you are But what I'm trying to say is that's, that's not why you write. And I was wondering if you could talk about why do you keep on writing? Why do you keep on doing this? 
but you have probably not, not much good at doing anything else. So, so that I have to keep. Sorry, I have to keep busy. I, I, I suppose it, it is a it is a sort of compulsion. I feel that there's there are so many there's still many things that I I feel are, I, I I need to say. And the thing is that that writing is if you, you have to keep keep doing it, otherwise you lose the thread. And it's it's very hard. If you have a long break from writing for whatever reason, it's very hard to to, to pick it up again. And 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 when you're writing, you're the the, the thing is that that writing is also thinking. I mean, you you don't first think and then write down what you thought. The writing is the thinking process. And and because you're always thinking as you're writing, then your thoughts always go on beyond what you've already written. And so then there's something more to write. <laughs> so that the thinking and the writing. Uh, co-generate one another and to stop writing would be tantamount to stop thinking you don't want to do that so you, or you could, don't, I mean that would, that would really be the, you, you might as well so, so you can't stop thinking and if you can't stop thinking then, then you can't stop writing and it just keeps on I think the two things keep on going but I do find I do find it it, it, it stressful and, and writing it's, it's really hard and it just seems to get more and more difficult as you, as, as you go on with it really hard but I'm, I'm trying to find a I'm trying to find a way of writing that um, a way of writing that that is somehow true to what you're trying to say Rather than uh, ra rather than responding to the usual sort of academic imperatives, which are different. Hmm. But I think I can't stop writing because I can't stop thinking, and I can't stop thinking because I can't stop living, and we might as well, yeah. Um. Hmm. I might even I don't know how long I'll last, but I might even be writing up there. I think. But, Just uh, another question. Uh, you wrote a wonderful essay on atmosphere. And uh, you know that here we work on the idea of atmosphere and ambience and this kind of topic. So I was wondering which role and which place you give of the idea of atmosphere in your thing and your thought and in mm. your. It's actually, um, I think it was around about, I, I, I suddenly I started thinking about atmosphere in about, oh, around about 2008, 9, 10. And, it, and just around that time, it was one of those curious things where often in scholarship you find that, that from many different fields, quite independently of one another, people start thinking about the same thing at the same time. And, and one of those was atmospheres, as you know, it's a, it's a tremendous resurgence of interest uh, just in the, from about the middle of the noughties, or about 2000, over the last 15 years or so. And, and you've been an important part of that. And, and, um, and it's also with surfaces, that's another thing, that suddenly in all sorts of different fields people have, have become interested. But the... the the reason I got interested in it was to do with... Um, I, I've been doing this work on lines and I come to the conclusion that life is generally lived not in places but along lines or paths or tracks or trails that, whenever, that for any, any living being, humans included, you've got to move and as you move you leave a trail and, and, and I was interested in thinking about life as a, a line or a trail, and, and therefore the ecology of life as being a, a, what I call a meshwork of trails, like lots of roots and runners, or uh, it's a Deleuzean rhizome, it's the same thing really. And, and, and so I was thinking, okay, the world is this enormous meshwork, this enormous mesh of, of lines and trails that living beings are creating as they move around and do their thing. I intuitively felt, I just felt at the back of my mind, that there has to be some kind of relationship between lines and the weather. 
Uh, partly because any living being also has to respire, uh, and that means they have to take in air and give air out, however they do it. Plants backwards, animals forwards, it's the reverse. But, but they all have to, to respire. They, there's, there's this aerial dimension to any kind of life. So I thought there has to be a relationship between lines and the weather. And therefore, when I created, I decided that my, my, my discipline was, and I'm a lineologist, I'm a student of lines, then there must be some connection between lineology, the study of lines, and meteorology. And so, and I wrote a book called The Life of Lines, which is trying to explore what this, uh, what this connection actually is. Uh, and, and so I got into atmosphere, thinking about atmosphere, from that direction. I was trying to think, how can we uh, find a way of talking about the atmosphere which would transcend the division between scientific meteorology and aesthetics? Could one think of a different sort of meteorology, a different kind of aesthetics, in which those two came together? So then I thought, what I mean by atmosphere is this unison that goes beyond the old science versus humanities division, or nature versus culture, a unison of cosmos and affect. How one could bring the cosmic and the affective together. And that was the job, I thought, that the concept of atmosphere could do. And then I could ask this question, OK, the world is a meshwork of all these lines. It's also an atmosphere. What is the relationship between the meshwork and the atmosphere? And the answer I came up with was that it's the same relation between breathing in and breathing out. So when you breathe in, you take in the atmosphere. When you breathe out, you propel yourself along a line. Uh, and it's like in, um, in the breaststroke in swimming, you first do this, and then you do that. Or, or you could think of a sailing ship, which takes the wind in in its sails and creates a line through the water. So that's, that, that's how it went. And that's, that, that's why I got interested in atmosphere and um, developed it in a particular way that I did. What is the advice you could give a young curious student in order to achieve that state of wisdom you talked about earlier and uh, as there is a lot of uh, distractions and information out there uh, in order to finish in the fewer who succeeded their life as you said uh, there will be millions who will fail. You. <laughs> you know that, that, that's the most difficult question. <laughs> it really is. Um, because, um, I mean, I've had a very, very privileged uh, career in that I was probably about um, around the last generation that could simply uh, finish their degree, do a PhD, get a job, stay in a, in a secure university job up to retirement and then enjoy a retirement with a nice pension. I mean, and, and, and ever since then, life has become more precarious, more difficult. Um, in the university world, it's really, really hard. Uh, the, the expectations that are placed on young scholars are, are, are basically unachievable. They, they're placed in an in, in, in almost impossible position. So, that, so that it's very, actually, um, it, 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 I, I'm not in a very good position to say you, I, I certainly can't say, well, you should do what I did, because you can't any longer. You don't, that, that, that opportunity that I had um, isn't there for the current generation of, of, uh, of scholars. Um, but, uh, so I, 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 I don't really know, I, in a way, I, the only advice is, 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 is what not to do, and that is, in a sense, not to allow yourself to be captured by, um, by the corporate academy. Uh, there, there has to be a, 
a, a resistance to that. And, and, and the only possible resistance to the, to the, to the, to the, to the the way in which the business model is taking everything over is from the ground up and from the younger generation up. That is that the, the, the people up there uh, in powerful positions are not going to change the world. The only people who can change the world are, are, are yourselves. Um, and um, so, um, I don't know, I think the only advice would be to, to, to be very, very courageous and stick to your principles and um, um, I don't know what else, what else to say, I really don't. I, 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 um, but but uh, I, I, the, 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 I, I've really come to. Th but what what I, I tell you what really annoys me, and that is that that the the way in which we the mainstream educational institutions assume that young people, from the youngest children up to to young adults, are not themselves able to forge a, or not, not able to participate in the process of creating a future. Uh, that they're supposed to be um, they're supposed to be uh, complicit in, in a future that has been basically made for them. And, and, and you hear so many young... You, you, you see young people being paraded on television in popular science programmes and things, sort of coming out with the rhetoric about what it is to be a, great, a young scientist, which has been pumped into their heads. And, and it's wrong. <laughs> And, and it's, it's terrible, um, this, this kind of, of indoctrination. And, and so we somehow have to campaign against it. Because it looks very convincing on the surface, but it's very debilitating underneath. I think. It's not a very good answer. <laughs> That's a very good question and a very good answer. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I don't know if there are uh, si other questions or interventions. We are coming to the end of the conference. It's the last one, maybe. So I will close the conference. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup à l'école de l'architecture d'avoir accueilli Tim pour cette conférence superbe, je pense très extrêmement intéressante. Merci au service de la communication d'avoir rendu possible le fait de pouvoir lire en même temps la conférence qui était très très utile, je pense, pour beaucoup de nous, d'entre nous. And thank you very much, Tim, again, for your very great conference. Thank you.